Well, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever time it is you're, you're watching this recording. Uh, we're hoping you're having a blessed day. Uh, the Skinners have been exposed to uh, COVID and thus he's asked me to fill in uh, this Sunday. Um, there's a couple of announcements I'll make. Uh, the men's group meets on Tuesday mornings at uh, six o'clock and uh, uh, we invite all men to come and the women are meeting uh, here at the church uh, on Tuesdays at 10.30. Um, on, the, on September the 7th, there'll be Taco, taco Bout, I uh, have to think about that, Taco Bout groups where the, the life of the new small groups, life groups uh, will be discussed and formed and I believe that we'll also be eating tacos. Uh, then the Team River class, which is the new member class, it too will be, it's been moved to August the 14th. Um, if you're interested in giving and you're watching this, you can do it by, by mailing a check uh, to the church address, 539 U.S. Highway, Highway 8384, Abilene, Texas, 79602. Or you can get and text it uh, by texting 84321 or get on the website and follow the instructions there. Uh, it's theriverabilene.com. Come, let us sing for the joy of the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God. This is my redemption story. You took my
2,000 years, we've tried to envision him, sometimes even to the point of contorting him to fit into our box. Because of our limited imagination, we can fail to grasp a limitless God, a God who is three distinct persons, but yet one, not only a Father, but a Son and a Holy Spirit. But can we truly know who God is? Can we relate to him and trust him the way a child trusts a father? As deep cries to deep, we all long to connect with our Creator. Knowing who God is doesn't just depend on us. He has already made a way for us to know Him. 
What if he can be known by his voice and his spirit and his word and his creation? God is beyond our imagination, yet he invites us to come to him, to know him, and to walk with him. This is how we truly come to know who God is. As we mentioned in the announcements, uh, Gina is positive with COVID, and David thinks that he's kissed her during her, um, her, her COVID experience, and so he's afraid he's going to be out of suit, uh, out of pocket for this weekend, and so he's asked me to, to come and share. Uh, allow, allow me to share with you some thoughts I've had about theology. I know that doesn't sound all that exciting, yeah, theology is the study of, of God, um, thinking about God. These thoughts may help you in your faith. I, I hope they do. And if they don't, I just hope that you uh, completely ignore everything I've said. I brought a couple of books with me. One is, you'll recognize this, the Holy Bible. That's God's Word. It is the Holy Scriptures. It goes by many different names, but it is the inspired Word of God. And, uh, and then I also brought Wayne Grudem, Systematic Theology. Now, doesn't that get you excited? Look how thick that is. If you happen to have gone to a, a Baptist seminary, you would have studied this in detail. Uh, Baptists refer to this as Big Blue. And, uh, but I want to talk about the, the concept of systematic theology. And not, we're not going to go through that, but I, I want to try to explain to you because we get confused sometimes when we, we think about what systematic theology is. This you'll find there are lists of truths, doctrines, beliefs, articles of the faith. You'll find that the, in the opening chapters, there'd be a focus on the Father, and then there'll be a focus on the Son, and then a focus on the Holy Spirit, and uh, a focus on salvation and baptism, the church, and so on down till you get to the very end and, second, and, and focus on the second coming. And if we were absolutely honest, there's a part of us that wishes that God had inspired the Bible to be more like a systematic theology so that we could just open it up and learn about everything about God and the Spirit and the Son and, and, and we wouldn't have to read through the Bible and try to figure out what God is trying to say. But let me, but that, this is the point. The Bible is a list, is, is, a, is a collection of stories of how God exposed himself, revealed himself, uh, shared with people, men and women who had experiences with him. And then they told their story. And their stories don't always match perfectly because, well, in some ways it's like the old Indian parable of the, uh, of, of the blind men that uh, uh, meet the elephant. And one, blind, one man's holding the wall, the, the side of the elephant and says, well, elephants are like great big walls. And one is holding the, tr the tree, the, the leg. So, well, elephants are like trees. And the other one's holding his tail. To, oh, no, elephants are like a rope. And the other one's holding the, whatever, the trunk. <laughs> he said, well, they're, they're like a water hose. And one hose the, the, touches the, the ear and says, yeah, elephants are like a great big fan, and they could go on and on and on. They each are true, but they're not all complete. The people, the men and women of Scripture down through history, they tell their story of how they experience God. And what they're telling is true for them. It may not be the whole truth. Um, these stories would, would have been then shared around the campfire and from one generation to the next generation until finally uh, a written language was created and, and, the, and the word was written and later in, then we have our scriptures. Now what I want to share with you is that there, the theology of the systematic theology 
I think there's a different kind of theology, and I want to, sh I want to share that with you. Now, I, I had some great professors um, and some great education, but I'd never heard any of them ever talk about how I'm going to talk about this. I believe that there are two levels of theology. First is the orthodox theology, the list making. The church has hammered out the details since the beginning. What is true and the result are the list that, that show up in systematic theologies. The second level of theology is what I'm going to call relational theology. It's more about the stories of people in a relationship. Let me give you some examples of what I'm talking about. A systematic orthodox theology will list the attributes of God. And it's not that they're wrong, and I'm not saying that at all. And they all have scriptures that support these attributes. But there's more to it. There's something deeper inside than just the list of God's attributes. There's another side of looking at things. For example, let's just, let's just name one of those attributes. He's omnipresent. He, that means God is everywhere. Well, who's going to argue that? That's true. But then when you open up the scriptures, I mean, right from the very beginning, you see something that's a little different. You see, Adam and Eve have this amazing relationship with God the Father. And he tells them what he's given them, and then he tells them what he has asked them to refuse to forbid themselves of, then what happens? He leaves. Man, you know the story. They, they eat and, and then, then they hear the footsteps of God. They run and hide. But the fact that he was there and then he left and then he came back. I mean, the relational theology opens those doors. But the very next story, the story of Cain and Abel, God tells Cain, you have to master the anger that's inside of you. And then what happens? God leaves. Or maybe, maybe if you read the story carefully, Cain leaves God. But he goes, finds a stick, and he beats his brother. And then what happens? God shows back up. Cain, where's your brother? Why do I hear his blood crying from the ground? You see this pattern? God's here, then he's not here, and then he comes back. The relationship theology opens those doors where the orthodox theology is, well, God's always here, no matter, no matter what, period, period. But let's... let's uh, Let's look at another attribute. That he is omniscient, which means God knows everything. Well, we wouldn't argue with that. But then when we pick up the Bible, those same stories, Cain and Abel, I mean, Adam and Eve first, hiding. And God says, why are you hiding? Did y'all eat? I mean, Orthodox theology says, well, of course, God already knows. Well, then why did he ask? Why are you hiding? Did you eat from the tree that I had forbidden? Same with Cain. God says, where's your brother? Well, I don't know. I'm not my brother's keeper. Why do I, why do I hear his blood crying? Why, why does God ask these questions? When he already knows, orthodox theology says, he knows it all. 
But why does he ask? Because he wants to be in a relationship with his people. He wants to have this conversation. There are times when he's near. There are times when he's, at least in our experience, when he's distant. He knows everything, and yet he asks questions. Let's even go deeper. Orthodox, Orthodox theology will say that God is non-corporal, which means he has no body. And we're told in scripture that God is spirit. But then you open up, you know, this book, and almost immediately you have all sorts of uh, strange relation. If God doesn't have a body, you have strange things that happen. I mean, we already talked about, they heard his footsteps. How do you have, hear footsteps if he doesn't have feet? And then you talk about David and, and in the Psalms. And almost every Psalm refers to some body part of God. I mean, you think about, li listen to the words of my mouth from Psalm 78. Make your face shine upon us. Psalm 80. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Isaiah 41. God performs mighty deeds with his arms. Lesson Luke chapter 1. Ortho Orthodox theology. Well, God didn't have a body. Re relational theology says God not only has arms, but he wants to hold you with his arms. Let's think about another attribute. God is unmutable. Well, that means unchangeable. It gets a little complicated, doesn't it? If God never changes, what do we do with these passages in Scripture when it says that God changed his mind? I mean, if, if I make the wrong turn, sooner or later i got to turn around and go the other way. Are we saying when, when it says that God changed his mind, that God made a mistake and then has to change and go back a different direction? Genesis 6. Right there we are. Some, there's some interbreeding going on, and we're not going to try to explain that this morning. But I want you to hear what it says. Genesis 6, starting with verse 5. And the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved. I'm not making this up. I'm reading this right from this book. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth. And his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth. Men and animals and creatures that move along the ground and birds of the air. For I am grieved that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Orthodox theology says that God would never make a mistake and would never change his mind. But in relational theology, right here we see God grieving, going a different direction. Now this becomes very difficult for the prophets of God because Deuteronomy 18, 20 says that if you are a prophet and you prophesy something that doesn't come true, you are a false prophet. And Isaiah knows the passage in Deuteronomy. And Isaiah is one of the greatest prophets. I mean, he's certainly got one of the bigger books. 
Isaiah 38, 1 tells a very strange story. God tells Isaiah, go see the king. This is Hezekiah. Go tell Hezekiah that the sickness that he has is going to take his life. His days are numbered. He needs to prepare his family. He needs to prepare, uh, get, get his house in order. You're going to die. Isaiah, that's exactly what God told him to say. Isaiah turned and walks out. Then we're told that Hezekiah, the king, turns, and it's, we have all these details, it's amazing. He turns and faces away, faces the wall. And it says he begins to pray, and he cries out to God. And then it says he weeps. Isaiah has left. He's walked across the courtyard from the king's uh, bedroom, his chambers, and he's just about to get across, and all of a sudden God says, wait a minute, stop, turn around. I want you to go back, and I want you to tell Hezekiah that I heard his prayer. Isaiah, what? I heard his prayer. I'm going to give him 15 more years of life. And I can just see the prophet. You gave me a word to give him. According to Deuteronomy, that'll make me a false prophet if I go back and say, I am telling you to go back and tell him that I'm giving him 15 years. I'm calling an audible. I'm changing the course of his history. I heard his prayer and I'm changing the prophecy that you just spoke over him. Whoo. And yet Isaiah does. He goes back in and says, and yet I can almost hear him going, does this make me a false prophet? Because what I said is not going to come true. Another interesting conversation between Moses and God up on Sinai. They've been up there a while and the people are thinking that Moses is not going to be able to come down. He may have died. Whatever, they began to gather up all their gold. They make a golden calf, uh, which is a symbol of the Egyptian God. And God looks down and he sees this and he, I don't know how else to say it, he throws a fit. And Moses is there going, what, 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 you know? God said, I am going to destroy the entire people of Israel. That's what it says. And Moses says to God, now they're, 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 they're just there themselves. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. And then this is one of the greatest questions. What would the Egyptians think if you destroy them? This is one of the greatest intercessory prayers in the history of all mankind. Moses speaking to God, and God said, okay, okay. And it says that God relented, depending on which, which translation you're reading, God repented and did not bring the disaster that he had promised. Think about Jonah. We all know the story of Jonah. We've all seen his cartoon. He gets instructions to go to Nineveh. He didn't want to go. He doesn't like the Ninevites. He doesn't like them at all. And he knows that if he goes and tells them what God has told him, that you're going to be destroyed in 40 days something could happen. So you know he tries to run. You know the story of the big fish. And, but anyway, Jonah ends up getting there. He tells them, in 40 days you're going you're gonna to be destroyed. Then he goes up on the hill and watches and waits. And what happens? The people of Nineveh, including the king, they fall on their face. They get on their knees and they begin to cry and repent. And God said, I'm, I'm going to relent. I'm going to Change my mind of what I have told Jonah to say. 
And Jonah said, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. That's the kind of God you are. You so quickly will, will change when people repent. But you told me as a, as a prophet of God to tell them that in 40 days they're going to be destroyed. And now I'm the false prophet. Now don't misunderstand me. Orthodox theology is true. There's just more to theology than just the orthodox facts or truths. And those who cling to an orthodox theology, to a list of doctrines, they're going to find themselves struggling with prayer. Why, why should I pray? God knows what I need already. Hmm. When we cling to the systematic theology, we end up having a God that is very, very unapproachable. He, is, he becomes so distant to us, not in a relationship. Does God want you to memorize all of the list in a systematic theology? No. He wants to be in a relationship with you. That's what this is all about. It's a relational. You know, when the, when the disciples said, they asked Jesus, we've been watching you pray. Would you teach us how to pray? Some people think that, that Jesus should have taught them a whole list of the things about, all the things that, about prayer. And you know, you know what Jesus said. Okay, pray like this. And he gives them a model prayer. We call it the Lord's Prayer. He says, start with our Father. And be ready. He's going to treat you like a father. He's going to call you sons and daughters. See, the whole point of this is that it's not about the facts or the doctrinal truths. We can argue and fight and people have for years and years. And what God wants is a relationship with you. We're going to celebrate communion. And I, I encourage you that if you're, in, you're at home, find some elements. Spend some time. Take some bread, take some, take some juice, and spend some time in prayer. And say, God, I want a relationship with you because that's what you want with me. Amen.